If anyone had told me in January 2020 that I'd be afraid to hug my grandmother in four months. Yeah. I mean, if anyone had told me our president would be our president. <laughs> that's, why I'm, that's why I'm voting for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're standing here at this rock. Do you remember the first time you saw it? First thing I thought was like, oh, those are the colors Spike Lee uses for 80 to 40 acres in a mule. 80s New York, or just black culture, you'd see these colors, Pan-African colors, mm -hmm. early 90s, and it start fading out. But this is always here. Definitely as a teenager, I was like, oh, this is the Marcus Garvey flag on the rock. And this is about Africa, black people, African-Americans, blood that's been shed in our land that we came from. In the 70s, a couple of women in the community fought with the city to have it painted this color. They won, and last week well, I realized this thing been in my head subconsciously ever since I left here. My ghost's still around here, you know what I mean? It's like the rock was a living thing, but then it like varied based on what was going on around here. Bad stuff would happen around here, and it's like, well, this rock don't mean nothing, because we, we obviously don't feel good about ourselves. You know, one of the reasons I got dreads is my barber, Raheem, he used to cut at Harry's shop, which is on this side of the street. And he finally worked really hard and got his own shop. They tried to rob him, and he wasn't having it. And he fought back, and then they shot him, and he died. So probably cut my hair since I was 10. And he was probably the first black business in his neighborhood. And then it was just like too traumatic to get a book haircut. Could not think about Raheem. Wow. It might even seem novel. I'm gonna do my best to get a pair of those sneakers up there on the power lines. You pay homage to a lot of people in your existence. I guess I do, yeah. Um, my, yeah, someone told me you curate your pain. Mm -hmm. You art direct your pain. <laughs> and through my travels around the world and all the work I've done, I think the most meaningful thing I've ever done is about here. You know what I mean? This place, you know what I mean? The beauty, I think, about black culture and the black experience is they've never been able to buy it. You can get a little piece of it, but the essence of it is priceless. You can't yeah. algorithm Kara Walker. Clive Stubberfield, you know, James Brown. I mean, we could go on and on. You could maybe take a picture and put it on a mood board. Yeah. Some weird way I feel like people are like, oh, look, we're great now. And we were messed up back then where it's like, to me, that's the highest level of success. Surviving 400 years of slavery. <laughs> and still having a soul. Still having a soul. Having joy, having grace. It's like Cornell West said. He was like, Cornell West was like, we'll see white people, see black people. You should give them a round of applause because they went through all that terror and they still made beautiful music, mm -hmm. still made gospel, mm -hmm. still happy, still make, you know, you know yeah. all the beautiful things. And it's like, it's deep, the Blackpool genius, you know? And the parts I get, um, celebrated are the parts that can be commodified directly, like, you know, athletes, entertainment, music, but mm -hmm. the list is like on and on. And part of the thing I do, Denim Cheers, is kind of about making black people feel great about themselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's about making themselves feel great about themselves from showing the bad sh stuff. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, look what we came through. Yeah. In 1619, first slave ship, White Lion. Mm -hmm. um, Till now, look what we came through, we're still here. And you know, with the shoe, like combining the rock, Marcus Garvey's flag, David's Pan-African flag, and recontextualizing the Stars and Stripes Converse shoe, and putting the black gaze on that shoe. We have been inundated by the white gaze in America, and it's time for us to start inundating ourselves with the black gaze. I believe people can really get involved that's my thing, is just like, if we could get to the point where like, civic duty, as is important as like this, like dress, I think that'll change America, change the world. But, but what, one of the things that comes through to connect to, your, to this work is that they, that style was part of the movement. If you look at Black Panthers. Oh man, you know, that's style. Like, yeah, it's great that you brought up the Black Panthers because style is a, also a signifier to your fellow tribe members. Mm -hmm. Whether it's style of how you dress or it's on your bookshelf. Like, so when we work with corporations, you know, that I'm not sure if they say they benefited from necessarily slavery, but benefited yeah. from the structure of white supremacy. Yeah, yeah. And you have the spirit of the ancestors and the struggle in you that's directing it. Mm -hmm. What is there any clean or good way? <laughs> All the big companies, just, they're banks. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's a movie company, sneaker company, they're banks, right? 
they're trying to make money by making products. Mm -hmm. Some of them are trying to make really good products. Some people, not so good products, mm -hmm. you know? My thing is, as a artist, creative, whatever, I see companies as a way to Trojan horse left ideas into popular culture. So it's like hitching a ride, like, it's like, you know, you, you walk and you don't got bus fare, mm -hmm. and then you, you hop on the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. It's just hitching a ride of David Hammond's, Marcus Garvey, across town mm -hmm. to the other side. But because of the way popular culture works, when, when kids, especially kids, young people, mm -hmm. when they see a mark or a thing like Converse or Nike or whatever, it spurns them. And then while you got their attention, like, oh, Tremaine? For Farmers Boulevard, used to live in London. He's doing something with Converse. That's, you got, a, it's like the hourglass turns once you work with the brand. Mm -hmm. And then the sands of time are coming down quickly. And you got a little, little bit of time to slide something in there. You know what I mean? And that's how I see it, you know? And I feel like leveraging it in that way is great. And then also I think you know, just through my experience with Converse, I've learned and been surprised in very good ways of when you pose a question or pose a challenge, they're down for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first time I voted was 18. What year was that? I know. 98 or 99. My parents always voted. Everyone always voted. My dad be like, people died so you could vote. My dad's stance was like, if you don't vote, you can't complain, which I don't necessarily agree with. My mom was very vocal about voting in the midterms. Mm -hmm. So she was like that layer of like, it ain't just about voting. She, and she was like, you know, you just don't go down there and just pick, you learn about the candidates and learn what you're voting for and what you're getting for your vote. I don't even remember the first time I, I voted. Um, it's because I mean, I think I turned 18 and it was not a presidential election year. So I think my first vote would have been for mayor. Wow. Yeah. I've also come to recognize that, that there's a finite game in the way that we talk about this left, the, the like, you vote blue, you vote red. Yeah. You know, as if those are the only colors that exist. Yes, yeah. <laughs> How do we even liberate the politicians from having to perform a very narrow perspective so that we can, you know, move into uh, a reality and deal with the present, <laughs> you know, yeah. rather than dealing with constantly the frameworks of the past. Both parties will support each candidate or whoever to the death just because it's the same. It's like, it's literally just like gangs. It's like, where's the gray area party? Right. Well, I mean, well, that's us. So I actually, I'm, I'm going to encourage you to run for office someday. Yeah, no doubt. I think, you know, I'll apply the same logic I think about why so many, you know, black people excel in American sports. It's because more of them try. Wow. You know why there's not a lot of creativity in the political landscape? Because not a lot of us try. The Infinite Game is about not being st stuck by the confines, but instead being willing, able, and, and courageous enough to change the rules in order to improve the state of play. The way in which we're still paying the price of the brutality of black people asking for basic rights yeah. and try to provide for their community. You know, we think about mass incarceration, the war on drugs, you know, being a direct result yeah. of the fear of free, happy black communities. We all suffered under the tyranny of like NYPD, you know, whether you, whether you were involved in crime or not. It's wild, it's wild. Well, it's wild, I'm looking at you, I'm listening to you and I'm looking at the sign over there, NYPD, Liberty farmers. Yeah. <laughs> Liberty, but we're watching you. <laughs> but also like accidental symbolism. Yeah. Or not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this goes back to voting. Um, that you know, I'd ra rather than like trying to figure out if I should believe the hype, I'd rather figure out how we can be the hype. You know, and if the the hype is the that this rock is just the beginning. Mm. So I'm just thinking, what can I leave ingrained in someone's subconscious? Mm -hmm. to come back and bring knowledge to the community that they, and hopefully get to a point where there are no more Tremaines leaving the community. That we could just stay here, live here, and prosper here. You know, maybe we're 50 years away from it, maybe we're 30. 
Maybe they're where too. Maybe yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 